The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello everyone, Michael Volkoff here and hope everybody can uh, hear me okay and can see the screen. Uh, we're coming to you from uh, beautiful Rome on uh, my way back from Sicily and uh, glad you could make it. Uh, if you have any questions or any problems with the, uh, uh, you know, with the reception here from Italy, let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, also, you should be able to download a, a set of the slides uh, if you weren't able to get them. And sometimes people have firewalls and other stuff that uh, prevent it uh, from happening. Um, uh, just shoot me a uh, shoot me an email at mvolkoff at volkofflaw.com, which is on the sheet here. Um, and then we can go from there. We have a, a really good turnout today. Glad to see that because this is an important issue. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, sanctions and export control compliance, and it's become a bigger issue. And uh, I thought the, the way to sort of set this up was to talk about it as the new FCPA and uh, and we can go from there. And what? And uh, as an agenda item, I want to define what the new FCPA means and what we can expect. Uh, show you some of what DOJ's new approach is going to look like. Give you some examples, and then talk again about the importance of sanctions and export control compliance and the imperative of that. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to post them up there on the questions uh, window, and I'll try to uh, get to them uh, during the uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot of slides in this, um, and at some point, so I probably will go a little bit faster than you would like, and I apologize for that in advance, but I wanted to make sure we at least touch base on a, a bunch of the uh, important issues. Uh, <clears throat> so. What are the elements? What do we mean by the new FCPA for sanctions enforcement? Well, let me give you what I think uh, the elements, and I actually came up with another one, which I forgot to include. First is that DOJ is going to start to play a lead role with OFAC and with BIS, um, which is akin to or analogous to the relationship between the DOJ and the SEC and even the CFTC, in terms of commodities, in FCPA enforcement. So a relationship where they have parallel investigations, certain cases may get handled by both, certain by just, let's say, OFAC uh, with a civil resolution. We'll see corporate, a rise in corporate resolutions, and this is perhaps the most significant part. In other words, we're going to see cases against companies for sanctions or export control violations that look, smell like, and are going to be sort of cottage industry type of business for the Justice Department, where you're going to have deferred prosecution agreements or even a non-prosecution agreement, uh, high, much higher penalties uh, than we've seen uh, normally. Uh, DOJ will be much more involved in bringing a, a, a number of these. And remember, these will come out of not out of the criminal division, but they're going to come out of the national security division of the Justice Department. We're also going to see higher penalties uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And in big cases, we may even get to a billion. Uh, and prosecution of individuals and then assignment of corporate monitors, and uh, just like the, if you took the FCPA enforcement and started back in 2008 uh, and watched the trajectory of FCPA enforcement, we're at like akin to 2008 when it comes to sanctions enforcement. And by that, I mean, you're going to see increased compliance expectations. One other point that, and I'm going to show you some examples of this is that you're going to start to see guidance 
for compliance programs, not only generally issued like we have right now, OFAC put out a sanctions compliance program set of guidance, but we're going to, in 2019, by the way, and we're also going to see within the enforcement actions, you'll see compliance guidance given. In other words, here's what the problem was. We expect people to do this in their compliance program. And that's very much akin to what happened with the FCPA. Prior to the issuance of the first FCPA guidance, there w- uh, people would read the tea leaves through, including myself, through the uh, enforcement actions and settlements as to what DOJ expected with regard to compliance programs. And I think we're going to see that uh, as well uh, again. So in terms of in the OPEC uh, context. So that's what I really um, uh, I would like to say. These are really the elements. And I'll show you examples of what we have so far. First off, we've had public pronouncements of the sort of new aggressive strategy. And we've had those from uh, from uh, uh, Lisa Monaco, from Christopher Miller, people from the deputy attorney uh, general's offices. And they've said that, look, this is we have to protect national security. So sanctions enforcement against Russia is important to our national security. And the rationale is to protect national security through export controls and from sanctions. Most importantly is the assignment of resources. If uh, you followed my blog and followed my commentary, I've always said, watch where the resources go because these resources are going to be, it's going to be mandated that they produce. So you have 25 additional national security division prosecutors being assigned for corporate prosecutions. It's like they're creating their own new FCPA unit and staffing it with 25 lawyers to start. And you can bet they're going to be under pressure to bring cases. Also, we've seen a separate investment, a substantial investment is what Lisa Monaco described it as in the Bank Integrity Unit for sanctions enforcement. So that means they're going to be looking at global banks. Uh, not necessarily focused on U.S. banks alone, but global banks to make sure that they're in compliance. And they turned this into a cottage industry many years ago for a while. A lot of the global banks were prosecuted for sanctions enforcement, and including like PNB Barabas, which was an $8 billion settlement. So what we're going to see are more cases being brought against the uh, global banks uh, as well in terms of sanctions compliance issues. Last is remember that there is, we have task forces and initiatives that have already started. The kleptocracy initiative, which will be used for sanctions enforcement as well. And the new one that was just, and I just posted a blog uh, entry today on disruptive technology task force which is a task force of the Department of Commerce, uh, the FBI, DOJ, prosecutors, and uh, they're bringing more cases um, uh, in the commerce uh, and the export control area in particular. Now, the Deputy Attorney General, Lisa Monaco, said that sanctions and export controls should be the risks should be at the top of every company's list of compliance risks. And interestingly, she said that they already have pending investigations of companies for sanctions evasions in industries including transportation, fintech, banking, defense, and agriculture. And there's going to be uh, even more, uh, a, even more in terms of where this is going. The overlap here, and this is, uh, there's another speech that was given by Principal Deputy Attorney General Marshall Miller, where he talked about the overlap that's occurring between corporate crime and national security. 75% of the criminal cases that have been brought this year, or I think it was last year, 
related to um, national security type of violations, be it sanctions, be it uh, money laundering. And it, it was an overlap between corporate crime and national security interests, including the Lafarge uh, case where they were basically funneling money to support terrorism. And the company ended up paying a $750 million fine. I'm not going to review that today, but that's an important uh, instance of an overlap between corporate crime and national security. The other thing, in addition to the 25 new prosecutors to focus on sanctions and export control violations, is the appointment of a first ever chief counsel for corporate enforcement and national security division. So his or her job will be uh, to organize cases that are be, that can be brought against companies based on the conduct in the doctrine of respondeat superior, where you can attribute the conduct of two or three, even one employee who breaks the sanctions laws or regulations, you can then uh, prosecute that person, uh, the company for which that person works in. So that's what I mean in terms of corporate prosecutions, corporate crime, all the rules that are used for corporate prosecutions in the white collar area are going to be used in this area as well. Now, the other nuance that we have to be mindful of here is voluntary disclosures. And the reason I bring that up at this point is uh, we're all pretty familiar with the voluntary, voluntary disclosure process for OFAC. And OFAC uses this as a mitigating factor. And, uh, and because we may be dependent upon OFAC or BIS, the Bureau of Industry and Security, for, from the Department of Commerce for licenses or even from the State Department for ITAR licenses, uh, voluntary disclosures by uh, companies subject to regulation uh, is always a sort of mandated or a good thing to do um, because you want to get along with your uh, regulator. Generally, OFAC reduces the maximum penalty from voluntary self-disclosures, and they reduce the maximum fine by 50% if you voluntarily self-disclose. Now, here's the wrinkle. And this gets pretty tricky. And uh, DOJ has a voluntary disclosure program for export controls and sanctions within the National Security Division. And it sounds very much similar to the corporate enforcement policy. So a company that voluntarily self-discloses, fully cooperates, and timely and appropriately remediates in the absence of aggregating fa aggravating factors doesn't have to plead guilty, can earn a presumption of a non-prosecution agreement, and will not pay a fine. Even if the aggravating circumstance is present, the company will earn 50%, a 50% fine reduction and no corporate monitor. And the aggravating factors there, it's a serious violation, or if it's a recidivist, or upper management was involved. So now the question is, when do you see conduct that, let's say, would require normally an OFAC voluntary disclosure, and you would also then have to voluntarily disclose to the Justice Department? What's the determining factor in that uh, disclosure sort of strategy and the calculus that you have to use? Well, it turns out we can look at intent. And this can be pretty tricky. So DOJ, a voluntary disclosure should be triggered in front of the Department of Justice going to the National Security Division if the conduct involves potential willful violations. Remember, OFAC violations are strict liability. It doesn't matter whether or not you knew or should have known uh, in terms of uh, whether or not it's a violation. It's a violation, but whether you knew or not can be an aggravating factor under the OFAC calculus. Now, here with DOJ, you're going to have to look at your facts for an OFAC self-disclosure and then make a determination as to whether or not you want to include the Justice Department 
in that uh, in that uh, self-disclosure. And remember that an act uh, is willful if done with knowledge that the conduct is illegal. But you don't have to know what specific law or regulation uh, that you are violating. So that's the difference here. And what I expect is going to happen as enforcement grows, so will voluntary disclosures to DOJ. So we may have situations where we're going to have a voluntary disclosure to the Justice Department and to OFAC. And I expect that's going to increase uh, in the next uh, few years. We also, just to give you a frame of reference, in terms of in 20, these 20 statistics for 2021 and 2022, the number of DOJ enforcement actions, individual and corporate, relating to criminal sanctions cases, criminal export controls, and ITAR actions. And you'll see the numbers grow has gone up. It's going to grow significantly, folks. Please trust me on this. It's going to go up and up and up. And we're already seeing more cases being brought, obviously, with regard to the Russia sanctions program. Uh, and that will continue. But we're going to see others as well, particularly with China uh, as a target country uh, of enforcement. So. Let's talk about some of the new enforcement examples of where the, what the cases are ultimately going to look like. And I'm going to give you four examples of what they're going to look like. And these four are important um, because they show how the enforcement strategy is evolving. And we've seen it already examples with BIS, OFAC. Uh, and we have a case going back to 2021, SAP, which was sort of the first uh, example. And I don't think we'll ever see a, 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 a case like that again, where the fine will be as low as $7 million in that case. So British American Tobacco, or BAT, if you want to call it that, just recently settled with the Justice Department and with the, with the OFAC. And they paid a combined penalty of $629 million for illegal sales of cigarettes to North Korea. Now, they also charged individually a North Korean banker and two Chinese uh, facilitators. And what happened in this case was a Singapore subsidiary of, of uh, British American Tobacco pled guilty to a, an information uh, to commit a uh, conspiracy to commit bank fraud and to violate sanctions. They entered into a deferred prosecution agreement, and OFAC announced a separate civil settlement uh, for $508 million, the largest fine ever in OFAC's history against a non financial institution. Years ago, OFAC would bring cases against uh, some of the global uh, financial institutions. This is, a, this is a perfect example of what we're going to see. And these types of cases, 629 million, massive internal investigation, uh, analysis of transaction by transaction to see what is actually uh, occurring. The conduct here is you've had a phony divestiture. In 2007, British American Tobacco said, hey, we're getting out of North Korea. We're going to stop selling to North Korea. Uh, and so they said, we're divesting and we're selling our uh, subsidiary that is involved in a joint venture with the North Koreans um, in terms of selling tobacco to uh, selling cigarettes to North Korea. North Korea has a long history of um engaging in cigarette trafficking as a way to sort of uh, generate funds. So uh, you knew something was fishy here because it was a fake sort of divestiture, divestiture. It was for one euro. They sold their entity to a third party who uh, became then the JV partner, but the JV partner was just a sham and it was used to disguise continued payments to British American Tobacco and this was known by people all the way up the ladder from the top of British American tobacco. It was a scheme 
devised and executed uh, by the senior management team. I don't know if it even went to the board. I'm not sure about it. It's not clear from, from the facts, factual statements. But the tobacco products were continued to be sold to North Korea and British American Tobacco eventually uh, would, be, uh, would earn money through this. And they used a variety of front companies in Hong Kong uh, and facilitators, like I mentioned, uh, in, in order to secure the money coming back to them. Uh, as well. But it was a phony JV and a phony divestiture in the way that they tried to uh, to go for compliance uh, in that case, because remember, the sanctions against North Korea were in 2008 as well. Okay, so now let's talk about the Department of Commerce and an example from the Bureau of Industry and Security. And this is a picture of somebody that we should all know, Matt Axelrod, who is the head of export enforcement at BIS. And he has been warning companies of a new era of aggressive export control enforcement. I actually happen to know Matt, worked with him in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. He's a very straight shooter. He's a really uh, top-notch type of prosecutor. But there's a reason they have a prosecutor heading this organization up. In other words, he's going to take it to higher penalties, higher fines, and his first action uh, to deliver on this promise after he went around and gave speeches and talked about how we're going to be more aggressive, they are going to be more aggressive, was he brought a settlement, the largest administrative penalty in BIS's history of $300 million against Seagate technology. Now, uh, what Seagate did was uh, they basically violated the Wowie sanctions, which are very, uh, you know, significant and uh, have had a big impact on, on companies' ability to deal with Wowie. And uh, going back to 2019, Wowie was uh, added to the entity list and imposed licensing requirements on exports, re-exports, and transfers of all items subject to the Export Administration regulations uh, that were destined to or involved a WOWI entity. The controls went even further, though, in August of 2020 with when you had the foreign direct product rule applied. So in other words, a foreign produced item uh, that was produced overseas, but nonetheless contained a certain amount of U.S. origin uh, materials. Um, and went to a Wowie entity um, is then also subject to the Wowie prohibitions because uh, once you're on the entity list, there will be, let's say, a presumption of denial of any license application. In effect, it operates similar to a sanctions, uh, like OFAC putting somebody on as a uh, specially designated national. So the foreign produced item is produced by an overseas plant. And a, or, and, and a major component of the plant is a direct product of U.S. origin technology or software that itself is regulated. So it hinges on how much of the product that's produced overseas contains U.S. origin technology or software subject to the ear. And in this case, it boiled down to hard disk drives. Uh, and Seagate continued to sell hard disk drives to Wowie in violation of the foreign direct product rule. Um, and they manufactured these uh, HDDs in China, Northern Ireland, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and the United States. And they used equipment, including testing equipment and other software and technology that was subject to the ear and the foreign direct product rule and nonetheless then uh, got into trouble. Now, what was even more interesting to me was that in September of 2020, Seagate announced, we're going to continue to do business with Huawei. We view, the, we view that we are in compliance, uh, and they were blatantly not in compliance, whereas their two major competitors, 
basically announced they and ceased all business with Wally as a result of these new rules in September 2020. So Seagate became Wally's sole supplier. They committed 429 violations, earned revenue of 1.1 billion, and they agreed to a $300 million penalty with BIS. And notice the absence of who wasn't part of that settlement or didn't come out with that settlement, and that's DOJ. And now you can rest assured that they may have made $1.1 billion in revenues uh, from this illegal conduct, but you can rest assured that DOJ is going to look at prosecutions of individuals, but in, in addition to prosecuting Seagate with a deferred prosecution agreement of some sort, or even a guilty plea, you never know. But it's going to be a large one. I, my bet is it'll be close to a, a billion or 700, you know, between 700 million and a billion that Seagate ultimately is going to get hit with for this sort of blatant conduct. And this is another example of what we're looking at in terms of corporate uh, enforcement. Now, there was a recent uh, OFAC um, enforcement action that's very important. Uh, because it involved not only a OFAC enforcement of 3.3 million against the company, and it's a cosmetics company, but there are some really important lessons learned, and they prosecuted an individual, and they, the individual had to pay a fine of 175,000. So over an eight-year period. Uh, ending in 2018. And I think the reason the Justice Department wasn't part of this or wasn't noted as to being part of it is they may have hit statute of limitations problems in 2018, uh, given that it's a five-year statute of limitations. But I don't know that for sure, because um, there could have been tolling agreements that were given to both OFAC and to the Justice Department if there's an investigation. But I don't think you would see a resolution with the individual in a civil context uh, prior to there being a decision on a criminal case first. So um, they, the cosmetics company uh, was uh, did business directly with Iran, um, and then they were acquired by Unilever uh, in the United States in 2015. Um, and uh, and once discovered, Unilever voluntarily disclosed the conduct to OFAC. And uh, there's the $3.3 million that was ultimately paid. Now, there was a third-party distributor. And in starting in 2009, Murad and the executive signed a distribution agreement for cosmetics to sell the products in the Middle East, including specifically Iran. At the same time, Murad filed an application with F uh, OFAC for a license. So they knew this was otherwise illegal and they needed the license, but they nonetheless went ahead with it. They renewed that, tran that uh, the uh, distribution agreement with the same CEO for a related company in May of 2015. And then in July of 2015, Unilever agreed to acquire Murad. And then September 1st, 2015, and they never disclosed to Unilever all of its ongoing business activities involving Iran. And they didn't discover uh, the conduct even during the pre-acquisition due diligence of Murad. And I wonder how good a job they did with regard to the pre-acquisition due diligence. Unilever, uh, and, and notice this, for six years, if they had done a search on uh, the internet, there was a Murad website for the Iran business, and wait for it, I mean, a really, really, uh, you know, disguising entry, murad.ir for Iran. So Unilever discovers this in October of 2015, six weeks after the closing, but nonetheless, after being told to stop it, the Murad companies continued to sell the products. The general counsel at Unilever told them, stop, stop, stop. They didn't stop. Then uh, the, after the bank inquired about a payment in 2018, uh, they were then directed again to stop, and this time they did. Now, 
a couple of points. And the reason I have Murad in here is this is another example of how an enforcement action has been used to communicate important compliance guidance. And this is uh, the headline in the compliance guidance here is how do you organize a sanctions compliance program when you have a global entity that um, a global entity with operations in the United States, a subsidiary, let's say, in the United States. And what uh, OFAC noted, and I've been dealing on this issue with other clients and colleagues in terms of how do we organize our, our trade compliance organization. And so the OFAC noted that one of the problems here was that the Murad staff, report the business reported to a trade compliance staff that was in the UK and it was Unilever's UK compliance staff and that they quote unquote lacked an adequate understanding of OFAC sanctions. In other words, they were a local, uh, you need to have local boots on the ground in terms of compliance activities in the United States. And OFAC made the broad statement that in some circumstances, placement of a U.S. entity under the compliance structure of a non-U.S. entity that may lack familiarity with U.S. sanctions laws could prevent prompt identification of and response to potentially prohibited conduct. That is a very telling statement. So if your parent company is a foreign company uh, and uh, uh, and is a foreign company, and um, you have a U.S. subsidiary, that U.S. subsidiary better have local boots on the ground, trade compliance people who are following OFAC on a day-to-day -day basis, and let alone D and DOJ. So this, this, to me, was an example that I wanted to point out to you because here, again, is an enforcement action that now gives you some guidance on what they expect in terms of your sanctions compliance program. Now, we also had two other reminders. One was we had C-suite misconduct and the executive's uh, violations because he signed two agreements, 2015 and 2018, resulting in sales to Iran customers. But what do we think about the pre-acquisition and post-acquisition due diligence and integration? Here, the pre-acquisition due diligence by Unilever, which is a, a, a large multi-billion dollar company, and post-acquisition integration and audits, apparently not done. And uh, a reminder from OFAC that you should closely oversee your new business to identify potential sanctions issues. Compliance reminders by themselves may be inadequate. And I would say that's a that's a classic understatement. And I would look to analogize to the FCPA process for integration and the requirements there for sanctions compliance purposes, because I think that's where everybody's going to end up anyways. So these are important uh, reminders that I want uh, that we should all be sort of mindful of as we uh, as we look at that. Um, we got a couple of uh, um, we were a couple of good questions I wanted to go through. Uh, one question is, is there compliance guidance specifically against Russia on resources uh, and export control? Um, we were sort of using the general guidance and not so updated screening. Yes, there is. And I'm going to go through that with the joint compliance notice that was issued uh, with regard to Russia sanctions. And there have been a lot of statements made about the Russia sanctions program in that uh, regard. And there's lots of guidance available on OFAC's website with regard to that. Another good question, uh, thanks for that first question, was does uh, BIS, the Department of Commerce, have a whistleblower award program for submitting tips? And the answer to that is no, uh, unless you can sort of bring it into a False Claims Act type of conduct or a securities uh, uh, violation, let's say a failure to disclose or something, or a, secure, or a lack of controls, 
And uh, so it would have to go through the SEC or it would have to go through um, uh, uh, the SEC or it would have to go through somebody else. Treasury is supposed to be getting together. Uh, it is supposed to be getting together some um, AML type of uh, whistleblower program. And that should be coming along soon. And we'll see that uh, start to ramp up as well. Uh, another good comment, uh, my guess is that Murad was such an immaterial portion of Unilever, along with Unilever not being attuned with U.S. compliance laws, resulted in such bad due diligence. Great point uh, for, from a good friend of mine. Great point uh, because it was, a, it was a small portion, I would imagine, or it's like a run-of-the-mill type of acquisition. Unilever has uh, done a lot of acquisitions and this was not, let's say, the, the largest on their plate, and I could imagine that. Okay, um, so one last case, just to in terms of what these new types of enforcement actions are going to look like, we had a clue in 2021 with a case that DOJ brought with OFAC and the Department of Commerce, uh, and they settled with SAP for more than $8 million for a, a large number of violations of the Iran sanctions program. So SAP cooperated, voluntarily uh, disclosed, cooperated and remediated, and they got a non-prosecution -prose agreement, but still had to make a payment in terms of the amount that was uh, disgorged or that they profited by. And uh, so they agreed to, it's a little over uh, $8 million. And uh, this was the first case that DOJ used in its new export control and sanctions enforcement policy, which we discussed earlier on with regard to voluntary disclosures. Uh, and SAP spent more than $27 million to remediate its export compliance and sanctions program. And for years, they engaged in systemic sanctions violations involving the sale of software and the downloads from the cloud. And that's the important part of this case as well, is downloads from the cloud to customers in Iran and involved indirect sales through resellers who were selling into uh, Iran to customers there. And SAP management ignored audit findings and recommendations because they were uncovering the absence of controls or even the business itself of uh, in uh, in Iran. So for seven years or so, they released software, they upgraded it, they had patches for it. Uh, and this was also the, the time period where we started to see delivery through the internet or through the cloud. Uh, and they had a cloud business group that also was uh, allowing Iranian users to access the US-based cloud services. Uh, the senior management was aware, and SAP did not maintain geolocation filters, which I've talked about in other, uh, that geolocation uh, filters and blocks are really important these days, particularly for software companies. Um, and so they didn't take any steps to, to sort of remediate the problem. Now, what was interesting in this case, and I've written about this case extensively, is that we had a number of remedial compliance measures. And this gives you sort of some thinking as to where DOJ may push the envelope when it comes down to, to sanctions uh, and remedial compliance measures. Uh, I know the person who heads the office. I work with him at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I'm, they, I know they came up with this in the context of this case, but they're going to be very much aware of this pres precedent, and they're going to be very much aware of the requirements that they need to impose on companies moving forward. So, um, and you'll notice here, having, let's start with internal reporting and timely review. All reports. Uh, that come in through a hotline have to be reviewed by the head of export control compliance within five days of receipt. Um, there also has to be an annual ethics and export control and sanctions training, which is already required, by the way, by OFAC. 
with regard to uh, sanctions compliance guidance, annual training is required, mandated. Uh, Third-party business partner notifications, that there have to be uh, notifications of your third parties as to they need to tell you about any violations of export and sanctions laws and their adherence to your code of conduct and relevant export and sanctions policies. Audits. Newly acquired companies have to go through audits, and if they identify any violations, they have to report it within five days after completion of the audit. And uh, if the newly acquired company has an insufficient or inadequate export and sanctions compliance program, SAP has 90 days to implement a sufficient compliance program. These are the kinds of requirements that we may see. Um, and then we have uh, notify, obviously a requirement to notify DOJ of any violations that they uncover later on during this period uh, for, of U.S. export controls or sanctions laws. So all of that is intended to give you a picture of what the new enforcement environment looks like. This is significant enough that companies need to this is what I would call board-worthy material. The board needs to know that we're operating in a different environment now and that investment in your global sanctions and export control uh, programs, compliance programs, is going to be critical and needs to be done uh, as soon as possible uh, with regard to your uh, sanctions and export control uh, programs. Now. Just a few reminders on the global sanctions schemes. We obviously have Russia, Cuba. Now we have Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk, the two parts, the three areas, regions of uh, the Ukraine where there's a flat prohibition. Uh, that also raises real difficulties. We've been working on that with a lot of uh, uh, our clients sometimes who have had business activities there with regard to geolocation and how you institute geolocation uh, blocking in those areas. Syria, North Korea, Iran, and Venezuela, uh, again, as well, uh, are uh, on the list. And remember the different types of sanctions, regulatory schemes that are important here, countrywide or comprehensive, selective, which means individuals and entities on a specially designated national list, Purpose-based restrictions, narcotics traffickers, restricted end users, cyber criminals now are uh, there as well. And we have sector-based, which is the SSI list in Russia. Uh, and then we have uh, non-SDN menu-based sanctions lists uh, as well. So, and that was really expanded in the uh, Russia sanctions uh, program that came into effect last year. And we know about the Russian sanctions and the crippling economic sanctions that happen across most major industries and the restrictions that just keep tightening. And I think we're going to see them tighten even more uh, as time goes on. Uh, as a result of just the recent uh, G7 meeting, there were new restrictions uh, adopted. Um, OK. Let's see. Remember that the sanctions regulations apply to U.S. persons, uh, and that definition includes subsidiaries, affiliates, and branches of foreign companies. But in the case of Iran and Cuba, it includes all uh, owned or controlled entities within, uh, let's say, uh, all the subsidiaries and affiliates, all that are controlled are, let's say, wholly owned or 50% or more uh, and controlled somehow. Um, and remember that it reaches uh, it can, the long arm jurisdiction of OFAC can get to any situation where you have uh, payments in U.S. dollars wherever located because they have to go through correspondent banking relationships. So remember, and U.S. persons also includes people with multiple citizenships. In other words, let's say they have a Swiss citizenship and a U.S., that will uh, then they'll still be subject to it as a U.S. person. 
And remember that it includes green cards, people who have work permits within the United States, are, even though they're foreign born and they're still awaiting their citizenship, they still are U.S. persons uh, for purposes of the guidelines, I mean, for purposes of OFAC regulations. Where this comes into effect in a big way is with regard to the term facilitation, which is broadly construed by OFAC to include literally uh, a person gets a call in Miami, and this is a true case, uh, and uh, it's from Iran, and they want to do business, and the person says, sorry, we can't do business with you, but let me give you my European affiliate who should be able to do business with you, and forwards the information and facilitates the ultimate transaction. In that case, the uh, affiliate, the action by the person in Miami was constituted a violation and the company was held accountable for it. So we've seen that happen as well. So now we're going to talk about sanctions compliance and the imperative of uh, implementation. Remember that we have five elements of a sanctions compliance program, and that is a management commitment risk assessment, internal controls, testing and audit, and training. And the senior management commitment has to be real, and it has to be significant, and it has to be to indicate that they are committed to a culture of compliance, that they're going to legitimize the program, empower the personnel, and foster a culture of compliance throughout the organization. Um, adequate resources and personnel will be assigned to it, Direct reporting lines have to be maintained between the compliance function and senior management, and we have to have a, a speak-up culture that is promoted. The risk assessment is critical for obvious reasons, and a holistic review of the organization from top to bottom to assess its touch points to the outside world. Your customers are important. Your third parties are important. Your supply chain is important. And I'm going to show you why based upon enforcement actions. Remember the impact that, and how important third parties is. Just like in the case of the FCPA, third parties are critical here. And the reason is that you are on the hook for the third party's ultimate disposition or selling of the good that you may have provided uh, where you know or have reason to know. It's a very loose standard, reason to know. And uh, if they sell to a specially designated national, the third party, you're on the hook. If they sell to an entity that's uh, beneficial ownership, is ultimately found out to include an SDN, specially designated national, or that it went to a prohibited country that, or was a prohibited end use, like military uses within Russia you're on the hook again for what the third party did. And you have to be careful because in Russia, there's a lot of uh, attempts to disguise ownership or affiliations and layering and evasion strategies, uh, sourcing that may be buried in a supply chain and always be mindful of geographic proximity, common staging locations. Eastern Europe right now is a, is a staging location, high risk, for Russian transactions. Dubai is a high risk area for transactions that ultimately go into Iran. Northeast China is a high risk area because of its proximity to North Korea. That's what is really important for all of us uh, to remember. So third party risks includes uh, uh, distributors and agents and robust uh, documentation, contractual provisions and certifications, uh, and we need end use assurances and documentation. The most important thing that I've seen to come out of the Russia sanctions program is that people are um, getting into end use assurances uh, and end use certificates uh, and documentation there. The supply chain risks, uh, which is a new frontier, sort of uh, OFAC started to push that, uh, and the need to have contractual provisions to flow down uh, within your supply chain and going to ensure OFAC compliance. 
And uh, your geographic and product risks have to be evaluated based primarily, I think, on close proximity to North Korea and Iran because they, you don't want to source materials from North Korea or Iran, which happened to Elf Cosmetics in 2019. And they ended up paying close to a million dollars when they sourced eyelashes from North Korea and they didn't know about it. They even didn't know about it, but they didn't exercise any supply chain due diligence. And uh, and they felt they failed to discover at any time that 80 percent of the false eyelash kits uh, supplied by two of their China based suppliers were included materials sourced from North Korea. And this is what I mean about your supply chain risks. And ELF then was put under a requirement to implement supply chain audits uh, and to require suppliers to sign certificates of compliance. And uh, they then conducted an annual enhanced supplier audit. audit. So these, this is an example of something that can occur because of the problems in your supply chain. The overall uh, other example, and Murad showed us as well, from mergers and acquisitions, the importance of due diligence. And for example, in the OFAC in 2019 had five cases focused on mergers and acquisitions. And in 2020, uh, they had another one which was called Keysight Technologies as well. So mergers and acquisitions for your risk assessment. If you're a company that buys other companies and those companies may be outside the United States, and so we're able, let's say, to deal with Iran, uh, when you acquire them as a U.S. company, they then become subject to the Iran sanctions program, and you have to make sure that their conduct is immediately brought into compliance and all sales are discontinued. We saw numerous cases where uh, company uh, salespeople sort of hid from uh, the new parent company that they continued to sell to Iran. Now, I mentioned earlier there was a question about guidance with regard to the Russia sanctions program, and I would urge everybody to take a look. It's called the JCN, or Joint Compliance Notice, the first ever issued by DOJ, OFAC, and BIS. Uh, together on compliance with Russia sanctions and export controls. And there's a comprehensive list of red flags. And I'm, I don't have uh, time to go through them all, but I would urge you to get the joint compliance notice, download it, and uh, use it as uh, a red flag sort of monitor, particularly with regard to uh, transactions that occur in related to Russia or in the hot button areas of Eastern Europe, which is a staging ground. And OFAC has noted that it's a staging ground uh, for that uh, for those purposes. Um, so you would need to look at that. Um, uh, somebody asked a really good question. Let me go back to: Can you talk a little bit more about the proactive auditing risks? Well, proactive auditing is, and we're going to talk about that. With regard to third parties, I would urge you, and we're happy to help anybody uh, in this area, to do proactive sampling of some of your third parties to make sure you know where the products went, you have the final documentation confirming where the products went, and that uh, there was no sort of, you know, attempts uh, to, you know, subterfuge or to hide something. Um, and you would need to do that in terms of uh, um, issues with regard to that. Another great question is uh, any recommendations for academic research endeavors on how to conduct export compliance review and proactive audits? Would there be, e.g., supply chain concerns? And my answer to that is yes and yes uh, on both. Um, academic research raises really uh, can raise really interesting issues because there are usually academic research activities that occur over uh, overseas, and there can be entities that you then become associated with or operate like almost akin to a joint venture. It's not exactly, but it's a collaboration that occurs, 
And you need to make sure that these entities, for example, are in the clear. And uh, so that raises a very, there should definitely be export compliance reviews. There also can be uh, technical materials uh, that are shared that you should be clear about in terms of making sure that they're not uh, regulated in any sense by BIS. And uh, proactive audits, I would definitely, you may have existing academic research projects going on, and I would sample, first off, I would figure out your risk factors being the location where it is, the nature of the research uh, and, and where it is. But for example, China operating with, uh, let's say, um, some of the state-owned universities there in terms of doing some academic research together or experiments or things like that, uh, uh, clinical trials, for example, all of that can become important uh, and should be looked at for export compliance. I think it's a really difficult issue. It's a great question for, um, uh, for you know, institutions, educational institutions. It really, sometimes I wonder how you all survive given the risk uh, factors that you face because I went, every time I've gotten involved with it, it can become fairly complicated uh, fairly quickly. So that's a great, uh, thanks for that question. Um, uh, okay, let's go back to where we were. And we were talking about the joint compliance notice. And here was my point with regard to uh, sanctioning end user and location verifications. So for example, this, we have a distributor and who in turn has a sub distributor and then goes to the Iran customer. We need to know that chain and we need to document that chain to the extent we can. It's difficult sometimes to get the distributor, but almost to get at least at a minimum, a certification from the distributor that they know it was not going to the Iran customer through a sub distributor. But these are the types of situations that can, you know, drive you a little mad when you're trying to uh, to verify things. And remember, our verification strategies have to be, did you know or should you have known? Where is the distributor located? Where is their uh, revenue base coming from? Uh, have we done good research concerning the distributor? Always check the distributor's website contractual representations, and use certificates, uh, and sampling transactions in the proactive auditing way that I talked about, and end user certifications uh, to uh, verify that. Okay, go on here to internal controls, and uh, this is the third element where we're talking about a compliance program and having written policies most importantly, people tend to rely upon just an in IT solution. Oh, we screened them. They, it was fine. Uh, and if you're, first off, before you can even start to rely on that solution, you have to document the selection, how it was calibrated, uh, and you should do at least annual tests to make sure that, it, that people that are blocked will come up blocked. Uh, and make sure of that. And you've got to make sure that people are all trained on how to use it. The important part of this is, however, internal controls that surround the use of the IT solution. If a red flag is identified, you have to have somebody else that's going to make the determination of how to resolve it. Uh, we, there was a case last year where the analyst who uncovered the red flag was able to just simply say, okay, uh, it's resolved and closed it. That can't happen. You have to have uh, segregation of duty, uh, you have to eliminate segregation of duty conflicts and make sure that four eyes look at that. Automation is imperative. I would urge people to have at least, you need to have a platform, not just a screening technology. And your database requirements are here with regard to selection, calibration, and routine testing. Remember, filter fault faults don't get you off. So if you rely on sanction screening, you can live or die with it. But two companies that, uh, and I'll come back to this in a second, Apple and Amazon, both had screening tool misfires and paid a price for it. 
they're not going to get away with such a small uh, penalty in terms of Apple. I think Apple's penalty equals about you know six seconds of its revenue. I think I calculated at one point annual revenue, whereas Amazon also got hit with a penalty. But these were for screening tool misfires and where there was something wrong in the way that they uh, were screening and they were not calibrating everything correctly and they made numerous mistakes. What's important after you screen is to investigate and resolve and document through inter independent research, additional database intelligence or research, and potentially getting an enhanced due diligence report. And you document how you analyzed a red flag, why you know that this is a false positive, and that there's no further inquiry that's needed, and list your good faith belief in why that's true. So we mentioned testing and auditing, uh, and uh, that your program has to be tested and audited, and uh, this, and it has to be, if you're going to do it in a proactive way, it's got to be done primarily through sampling and sampling and sampling because you can't uncover every or go through every transaction and sampling is the way to go. And this is what I mean by sampling and monitoring your third parties and looking at these types of questions. And the last element is training. And I'm going to remind you that it has to be done. Sanctions training it's a requirement from OFAC has to be done at a minimum every year to those people who uh, deal with the sanctions or come into contact with sanctions risks. Sorry, everyone, to go a little bit over. Uh, please uh, contact me um, if uh, you want a set of the slides. Here's my uh, my email address. Let me uh, and I. Uh, I apologize for not getting uh, to all your questions, but I will pick them up and write to you and uh, talk to you about uh, whatever question it is that you have. Here, let me also just run my poll. If anybody needs some help immediately or wants to do something uh, with us, we'll, we'd love to do that and just put down yes, and I'll reach out to you and send you information. Uh, this is an important enough issue. It needs, the board needs to be brought into it. The new FCPA has got to be explained to them so that they realize this is just not running a screening and then saying, okay, everybody's okay. We need to build a compliance program because that's what's going to be required and it's going to be what's mandated from the government uh, as through we and it and if we wait until there are large settlements we're going to be behind the curve let's start to do it now let's start to get going doj has told us they're coming and now's the time uh to do that so thanks again everybody uh and apologize for running over a little bit as you can see there was a lot of material we had some great questions and uh thanks again for those uh terrific questions and i'll get back to you if i didn't already um, again, uh, take a moment just to respond and I'll reach out to you. Uh, and if you need the slides, I'm happy to send them to you as soon as possible. Okay, everybody, have a great time and uh, stay in touch, stay out of trouble, and uh, we'll see you soon with another uh, webinar.